Hi everyone, and welcome to the first discussion for CS168 this semester, fall 2022. My name is Alex Krenzel, and uh, I'll be teaching this video discussion. In future weeks, there will be a different TA who teaches each discussion. Um, we're making these mainly so that if you have to miss discussion, um, because you're sick or for some other reason, that there's a way for you to catch what you missed. Of course, I still highly encourage you to attend an actual in-person discussion because there'll be much more give and take and much more interaction. And especially future weeks where there's problems that we're working through, you'll be able to work with your classmates on them. But let's dive into it. Today's discussion is pretty short. Um, so today we'll be starting with a little bit of introduction. If uh, we were in class, I'd ask about you as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the terms that were introduced in the first lecture and will be introduced this week. And finally, we'll finish off our discussion um, by just poking at the internet and playing with some tools and getting a sense of what the internet actually is. Um, but it'll be a pretty light discussion, and so I would expect that we finish early. So to start with introductions, a bit about myself. Um, my name is Alex Krenzel. I grew up in upstate New York, I finished high school in Kentucky, and I'm a networking PhD student advised by Scott Shanker and Sylvia Retnasamy. Now, I actually went to Berkeley for my undergrad and took this class back in 2017. Um, and then, yes, graduated in 2019, and then spent three years working at Google. Uh, and in between, I spent somewhere in there a semester lecturing intro to CS at Howard University. Uh, Fun fact, at my time at Google, uh, I worked on something you've probably seen. Uh, have you ever seen a pop-up like, like this? This I was on the team that was building these pop-ups and serving them to people at YouTube. Um, so you probably just always get a quick skip trial. Uh, I did that for just about a year and a half, and then I spent my other year and a half doing systems research, specifically networking research on Google's wide area network. Um, my office hours uh, are going to be Fridays, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, and my email is acrenzel at berkeley.edu. But do uh, prefer to post on ed because uh, that way, whatever question you have can benefit most everyone else. Okay. If we were in class together, I'd be curious to know the distribution of majors. I imagine a lot of people here are X or CS or maybe data science. Uh, I'm always curious to know where people are from. Um, and especially I'd like to know why you're taking this class. What exactly it is that you're looking to get out of the class. It was one of my favorite classes as an undergrad, but um, I didn't have a great reason for taking it. And I'm, I'm curious if others are in the same boat or if there's something in particular you want. Um, so with that, I would ask for questions from lecture. If you're watching this video, feel free to post those on Ed and the TA will get back to you there. Um, otherwise, we'll just dive into our terms. So in the first lecture, you saw Sylvia introduce why the network is important, why the internet is important, um, and talk a little bit about how this class is going to be an overview of the architecture of the internet and the design choices that went into producing the largest system in, in pretty clearly the, the history of mankind. Uh, some of the terms that get used as we talk about the system, I remember confusing me a little bit when I started, when I was taking this class. In particular, one of the most confusing to me was this difference between routers and switches, uh, because they seem to be used interchangeably, but maybe they seem kind of different. So a router or a switch is a device that forwards packets. So a packet arrives on one link, comes into this device, and a router or a switch will take that and put it out on a different outgoing link. That's all it is. And this diagram, it's these kind of gray boxes here. Um, and as a packet maybe comes in to on one link, the switch takes that packet, looks at it, makes a decision, and then based on that decision, puts it out onto a different link. Maybe a link going this direction. Uh, what I was confused about when I first saw this was why there are these two terms and why sometimes people use them seemingly to mean something different by them. Uh, 
For this class, you can make no distinction between the two, use them as synonyms, use them interchangeably. Um, out in the real world and in the past, there was more of a distinction where routers were a bit smarter and switches were a bit dumber. But especially as kind of commodity hardware, cheaper hardware continues to improve, switches kept getting more functionality, and now they're pretty similar. And so really, you can just use them interchangeably. So don't worry about that difference. The other term that you would have heard Sylvia use is end host. And an end host is a device attached to the network. And these are devices that are actually putting packets onto the network or receiving them from the network. So they're at the very end, and they are hosts. Uh, and examples of this are mobile phones, maybe your laptop, a security camera, smart fridge, anything that's really reaching out to communicate or receiving communications, like a server at, at Google, say. Um, now, packets. So we've been talking about putting data onto the network. That's what an end host does. It sends or receives data. But what does that data actually look like? Well, that data is sent in a packet. And a packet is a bag of bits that has a header and a body. And the body is going to contain just whatever the communication is that the end host wants to send. So here, if I were an end host, I'd probably send go bears. Um, and so I'd put that into the body. And I'd slap a header onto the front. Um, and this header is what has special information for the switches and routers in the network to decide what link to uh, uh, put, uh, put the packet out onto and to make any sort of routing decisions, routing being where the next hop should be and the next link to put the packet on. Um, and so the header has any sort of information that the network needs to make decisions. Um, equally important, the body just isn't looked at. And it doesn't really matter what you put in the payload because the routers aren't going to look at the body. They're concerned with just the header. Uh, and we'll be learning much more about what these headers look like and um, how at different layers um, in our system we add information to that header, or remove information, so on and so forth. Uh, this week we're going to learn a little bit about naming. And I'm bringing it up now a little bit early in this discussion because some of the tools we play with have to do with naming. And so I want to give you a little bit of context, but don't worry, we're going to spend a couple of lectures this semester really diving deep into naming and addressing on the internet. But for now, you should just know that uh, a network name is something like mywebsite.com. It refers to which host you're trying to talk to. Uh, the address is where that host is located. And so when you move a server, you pick up a computer that's serving your website, and you take it from Corey Hall to, let's say, Soto Hall. Um, its name won't change. It's still mywebsite.com, but the address is different. It gets assigned a new address because it's no longer in the same place. Equally kind of interestingly, it's not like a completely a totally physical address. Um, you can't with complete certainty map from like the numbers 142, 250, 72, 206 to a physical like location. It's not like a, a latitude and longitude. Um, if the location changes, you are very likely to get a new address. Um, but again, we'll cover this much more later on this semester. Um, a few other terms, three more here. One term that you'll start hearing thrown around is the network stack. Uh, this term is maybe a little bit overloaded. We'll hear it in maybe two contexts, one of them being talking about the layers of our system. Um, that is the internet and the internet architecture. Um, but usually there, we won't say network stack. It'll be more like layer two or layer three or level layer four. And we'll learn about later in the semester. Uh, the other place where you're, you'll hear the term network stack is when referring to the actual networking software on the host. Um, and so each one of your devices, your laptop, your phone, et cetera, uh, or a smart fridge has some portion of its operating system that is responsible for actually using the internet. Uh, and so I talked a little bit about packets. Well, deciding what you should put into that header um, and deciding how quickly to send your data and put it onto, onto the internet. Something has to make those decisions. Um, and it isn't Chrome that is making that decision. There's actually a part of the operating system that's responsible for that. And we call that the networking stack. Um, 
Now finally, two terms that I'm only introducing here a little bit early because you'll see them in lecture on Tuesday because uh, they'll be useful for the tools we'll be using in a second, are ISP and AS. And so an ISP stands for Internet Service Provider. And you should just think about this as a network of routers and links that provide network access that you pay to get access, um, that provide you access to the internet. And so whenever I, I hear ISP, I really think of like Comcast or AT&T or Sonic or Google Fiber or one of the other providers, internet service providers. Finally, we have this term autonomous system. And again, we'll be spending a couple of lectures on this stuff later on in the semester, but for now, just take this at a high level because it'll make playing with the network more fun. An autonomous system is a group of routers that are controlled by some entity. That's all it is. And so, for example, uh, Berkeley has bought a whole bunch of routers and put them all over campus. Um, all of those routers are part of Berkeley's autonomous system, Berkeley's AS. Um, usually, ISPs um, have one AS, but some could have multiple ASs. But Crucially, routers that are within the same autonomous system can trust each other. And that will affect some of our design decisions, um, as we'll see later on in the semester. OK. So with that, we're done talking about the terms that we saw in class. Let's get to the fun part, where we're going to actually interact with the internet and poke at it. So a couple of tools. The internet's super large, super complex. As Sylvia mentioned, there's over 5 billion users. Um, just an insane amount of data being passed around and generated. And to transmit all that data, tons, just tons and tons of routers and, and, and links. And so to try to understand what's going on, researchers and engineers have built some of these pretty useful tools. And so we're going to play with them today. Really, I just have this disclaimer here so you don't get too stressed. Think about this as a tinker, tinker discussion. We're going to play around, interact, engineering mindset, see what we can kind of play with and, and what patterns we see as we play with the internet. Uh, but you're not expected to know the underlying concepts yet. We haven't covered them. And really, we're going to spend the whole semester trying to really deeply understand what's going on within the internet and how it was designed to be this way. So the first tool is called ping. And this is a handy tool. It just lets you poke a website and see if it moves. Um, and you do this by saying hi, sending a hi message, and hoping that you get a hi back. Now, this tool also times the length of time that it takes to get your reply from when you sent. This is kind of cool, um, and I'll talk in a second about why. But let's try it out with a couple of websites. Um, so if we were in discussion, I'd ask for predictions. So guess in your mind right before as I... Um, actually, let me even pull. Yeah. Take a guess. How long do you think it will be to reach berkeley.edu? And to be clear, it's kind of, if I go back here and I open a new tab, when I go to berkeley.edu, it pulls up our website. And so if I go to our terminal here and I ping berkeley.edu, let's take a look at what we see. So this tool gives us an output. And again, we're not expected to really know or fully understand what this is yet. But one thing we notice is we ping berkeley.edu. And in parentheses here, it says 35.163.72.93. That looks a lot like an address, as I was mentioning earlier, an IP address, in fact. So probably this is the IP address of berkeley.edu. We're sending uh, 56 data bytes. OK, I guess we're sending 56 data bytes. And here it says we got 64 bytes from 35, 163, 72, 93. So that's the same address. So we got a reply back. We sent 56 bytes and got a reply back. And it took 27 milliseconds. So I'm sitting here um, in, an apart, uh, in, in a house in North Berkeley. And from here, it was about 27 milliseconds. It's actually super similar if I were doing this on campus in a, in a room on uh, Cal Visitor. Got the right, same amount of time. So. 30 milliseconds, that is super fast. In fact, actually, just I'm curious for context to think of an I time. Um, wow, 
So okay, so blink of an eye is about 100 to 150 milliseconds. So the round trip time to go and say something to UC Berkeley servers and get a reply back is faster than the blink of an eye. And in fact, you could go back and forth five times in the time that it takes you to blink your eye. That's pretty magical. Uh, so let's keep going. Let's try another one. So do you have a prediction for Google? Where do you think Google servers are? I think they'll be longer, quicker. Um, let's give it a try. So I'll clear here. Pinggoogle.com. Wow. Okay. So incredibly, um, as we ping here, then google.com, here's an IP address. So it's probably Google's IP. Again, we're sending 56 bytes and we got a reply back in how long? In 8.828 .8 milliseconds. So to ping google.com and get a response back, a full round trip. So not only just travel, but also take into, uh, the, into account the time that it takes Google to actually generate response was under nine milliseconds. Or kind of on average here, we can see uh, see the minimum average max standard deviation. So an average of 10.8 milliseconds. So you could do 15 round trips and including the time it takes Google to generate response in the blink of an eye. It's interesting, right? Because physically we are closer to Berkeley. And so you would think that this number would be higher because Google probably doesn't have servers literally here in Berkeley. They're probably somewhere else. Maybe they're in Mountain View, maybe they're also in California. But what's happening here is that Google's entire strategy is driven by showing your result as quickly as possible. Um, and so the faster they can load, um, the more you search on their site and the more ads you see and the more money they make. Um, and so they have thousands of people working on trying to just get this number down as, to be as small as possible. And so they've really optimized not only their network, um, but especially their servers and how quickly they're able to take a message and build a response and send it back. So that's why this is so quick. Um, okay, so let's go back over here. How about Ford? So Ford.com, which I can pull up here. So I type in Ford.com, takes me to this website. Unless they have a new car or something. Uh, well, no, they're celebrating their 1966 Bronco. Uh, well, I'll give you a hint here. This is headquartered in Michigan. So how much longer do you think it is to get to Michigan? Let's go back over to the terminal. Um, so instead of google.com, let's do ford.com. Hmm, okay. So we see 77, 79, 80, 79, 82. Let me stop that there. So hovering just around 80 milliseconds. Um, that's interesting. You might ask, hey, Alex, why is this like not even three times as long as it takes to have a round trip to Berkeley? Um, but this is all the way in Michigan. Um, and that's, you know, I, I, you actually wouldn't know that automatically, but I, I looked it up beforehand. That's where Ford has their web servers. That's at their headquarters. And again, the answer becomes partly that um, a solid chunk of that time, of that 30 milliseconds, the round trip to Berkeley servers, was actually waiting on Berkeley servers themselves to build a reply and answer back. Um, and so maybe Ford's servers are a little more optimized, and so they're quicker at getting a response. Um, maybe it's also there's like a pretty efficient path to get to, to, uh, to Michigan, to Ford. Let's go back and try a couple of interesting other ones that I've picked here. So we could try csail.mit.edu, which is our friends over at MIT. And so if we do ping csail.mit.edu, um, we also actually get something closer to 80 milliseconds, mostly across the country, kind of like Michigan. So that makes sense. Um, and now finally, we'll go back and I think I have, ah, I have two other interesting ones. So let's go all the way to Munich um, and ping the University of Munich, see what happens. LMU.de. 
And now we're getting into something even bigger. So 166 milliseconds, getting really out there. Um, but again, keep in mind how incredible this is. I, I looked this up beforehand. The University of Munich servers happen to be in Germany, in Munich, hosted by the University of Munich. It takes about the length of a blink of an eye for the data to be sent from my computer here in North Berkeley all the way to a computer sitting in Munich to be processed and sent all the way back. That's pretty incredible. Uh, and not, not only that, it does that consistently every time, second after second, as billions of other people do the same thing from their devices, whether they're streaming uh, a video or they're on a live call, um, or they're just pulling some data, they're downloading files, transferring files. So let me stop there. Um, finally, I think I have one more cool one here on the slides. Yeah, so we've got uh, University of Namibia. So if I pull up their website, .na. let's see if this loads. V.N.A. Namibia. Where's their website? Oh, there we go. Should take a little bit of time to load. Um, looks like they're actually. Yeah, got this nice website, modern looking. Let's see how long it takes to reach them if we ping their servers. Unon.edu.na. Wow. So almost 300 milliseconds. Again, still pretty incredible. Um, Namibia is a country along the western coast of Africa. And so in about 300 milliseconds, you have a round trip from your computer in Berkeley all the way there. Okay. That was kind of fun. Uh, if we were in class, I'd take kind of some requests and we'd we'd do this together for fun. But let's go on and talk about this ping number that we've been seeing. This is the time it takes to get a response uh, is called latency. So latency is the time between when a request is sent and when the response is heard. Um, so actually a fun thing you could ask is, hey, what about, uh, you know, similar websites like uh, Google in the US versus Google in the UK. Um, so how do you think, how much longer do you think it would take to reach google.co.uk? And um, I'm gonna spoil it here and show you if I ping google.com, it's still our nine and eight milliseconds as we saw before. And then if I go to ping google.co.uk, probably would have guessed it would take about a hundred something milliseconds based on the 150 that we were seeing to reach Munich, but it's actually still super small. Still nine, 10, eight milliseconds. Uh, and this is actually because uh, Google does some tricky stuff where you might notice here, these IPs are kind of similar. Uh, and uh, Google's actually can tell that when you ask for google.co.uk, you're actually asking from the US. And even though you're asking for the UK version of Google, they're gonna serve it to you from somewhere closer. And this is just a little trick scenario to show you that um, things are actually more complicated on the internet and there are all these little hacks that are used to optimize these interesting cases where someone requests a similar version of a website and you know Google wants to make sure you get a really quick response and so they don't do exactly what you want, they, they do something else that they think is better for you. Okay. Now, going on, uh, we're gonna talk about the tool called Traceroute. Traceroute is a tool that lets you trace the routes, hence Traceroute, that packets take from your computer to some destination. Um, and so this is the same diagram as from before. So if we're kind of, this is us running on the end host and we're communicating with some server over here. Um, Traceroute is gonna tell us, okay, this was the first hop, this was the second hop, and then we reach our destination. And so we're gonna actually see what the routers are that are participating. So let's give it a try with these same websites that we were looking at before. And I'll just pick some favorites here. 
first, let's give it a try with uh, google.com. So if I do traceroute google.com, um, so what do we see here? First, we started with, okay, 192.168.4.1. Um, I just happen to know from having a little bit of experience with the network that IPs that start with this 192.168, actually local IPs here on my local network in my house. So that's the thing local to me. And then we get um, this lo0.bras3.albca11. And my guess here is that this is Albany CA. So we'll see in a second, we'll look this up, but you can kind of see these names of the routers. Each of these is a hop, certain router. So this is Albany CA 11. Dot sonic dot net. And Sonic is the ISP that I pay for my internet. And so we can see that it takes, um, kind of on my local network, it takes, wow, just like eight, seven milliseconds. Um, but then reaching the next hop takes seven to nine milliseconds. Then we get passed around Albany, Albany. Again, these are guesses here. RCMD, California. I bet that stands for Richmond. And that seems similar to Richmond, California. And then a different time for a different hop, we actually went to Hayward. Then we have these stars. So what's up with these stars? Well, this is a hop where the router actually refused to say who it is. When it got the packet, it just said, I'm not gonna tell you who I was and just dropped that packet. And the fifth and the sixth hop did that. Then we're back here for Equinix SJ, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe San Jose, perhaps. Um, then going on. Uh, it looks like here we have Google dot something dot something dot Equinix SJ dot Sonic. And so I bet this is a router that kind of connects Google and Sonic together, where they actually connect to each other. And then going on, we have just these IPs without names. And my guess is that this is somewhere inside of Google um, and being passed around Google's network. And so it took us a total of 13 hops to get to google.com. And uh, actually, while we're at this here, uh, there's a handy tool online called GeoTraceRoute. So I'm gonna open this up and over here, if you select in the source, scroll down and get to us-berkeley. Um, then you can type in the domain that you want to actually visualize. If I do google.com, then it's going to run the same tool, traceroute, but then it's gonna visualize and try to guess, based on the names and based on the IPs, the actual physical addresses where each of these routers are. So if I pull this out, if you take a look, it looks like what happened was, um, hey, this is really cool actually. So it looks like what happened was, for whatever reason, uh, we started off here in, um, oops, let me just fix this here. We started off here in, uh, in, in Berkeley, and then the next stop took us to Mountain View, which is Google's headquarters. But I guess for whatever reason, our packet finally ended up in Seattle and was handled by Google servers there. That's probably because Google happens to have a pretty big data center up um, in the Pacific Northwest area around Seattle. Um, okay, let's go back to our slides here. Um, another cool one, I kind of want to see what the path to Ford will be. So how we actually get to Michigan, which is where their servers happen to be. So again, I'm going to first go back to the terminal and we're going to run it here. I'm going to run traceroute ford.com. And again, we start super similarly. So 192.168.4.1, um, probably some something local to me. Um, then we have uh, all BCA11. And again, I just happen to know this from pattern matching since I've run this command in the past. But usually the front part of this name is like which actual router this is because probably in Albany, Sonic has a bunch of routers. Um, and then this is like a physical, probably location name, Albany, California, and sonic.net is my ISP, my internet service provider. And so if we stay up here, we can see 
for our third hop, we stayed within this um, Albany, California data center, or um, kind of point of presence where uh, Sonic has its hardware. And then we keep going down. Looks like we're in Hayward. Again, I'm not really sure what Equinix is. PAO1.sonic.net makes me think Palo Alto for some reason. It's just a random guess. Um, looks like at this point, at hop nine and 10, we're getting onto cogentco.com, which is probably a different um, ISP that Sonic has an agreement with to hand off its traffic, something we call peering. Um, we'll learn about that later in the semester. And it looks like, yeah, this still is within San Jose. Um, now you'll notice these like three dots take a while to appear. You could be wondering, hey, why, why is that? Well, our tool is gonna actually wait a little bit for a response. And it's programmed to wait a second each time and it'll try, try three times in case a packet got dropped accidentally. Um, so that's why this takes so long. Uh, in the meantime, while we wait for this to finish, let's go back over to Chrome and actually try running this visualizer um, to reach 4.com. And it runs a little bit quicker. I think it has a slightly modified algorithm um, for how long it waits. So I think it'll finish actually before our terminal trace route is done. So we can see and visualize on this map exactly what happened. Um, kind of as we had read on the output of the terminal, we start here from UC Berkeley um, as expected. Then we kind of saw when we went to San Jose, then we get to town and county. So I, I really don't know what US town and county or country is. Seems like it's just like some location in the middle of the country. And then we jump up to Chicago. So uh, I guess for whatever reason, this was handled by a server in, in Chicago or nearby. Um, and it's kind of cool. You can see here the path real distance was um, 2,228 kilometers. And the actual distance, I think, as the crow flies is 2,961 kilometers. So that's pretty good, it's pretty efficient. Let's go back and, and I'll just show you here on the terminal, it's still running. Uh, it's still, uh, uh, these hops in between are, are, are dropping. So I'm gonna kill it actually. But we could have let that finish and seen what happened. Let's, let's go back and run one more. And a fun one here is gonna be running this University of Namibia. And so, um, Instead of running it in terminal, I'm just gonna go right to this tool this time and just run it here. So unam.edu.na. Unam.edu.na. And again, all this tool does is it runs exactly the same kind of trace route that we were running in terminal, but then it maps from each of these names that I was kind of doing manually. Um, it does it more programmatically to points on a map and also based on the IP address. Uh, this one's really fun to see. So. Yeah, this one's awesome. So if we come over here, whoops. So we started off in Berkeley and again, we went to San Jose. Now why San Jose? It seems like a lot of the ISPs have um, kind of routers down in San Jose and that's where they seem to interconnect. And it also seems to be where the like cross country cables um, just happen to arrive to the Bay Area. Um, and so that's why it seems like it keeps going down to San Jose because there isn't really a direct cable. No one laid a cable from uh, the other side of the country to, to Berkeley. They have a, a select number of cables across the country to different places and that seems to be here San Jose. So we went from Berkeley to San Jose, then from San Jose all the way over to New York. And then at this point, our data got put on a cable that was going under the Atlantic Ocean. And these are really cool. Um, so C cable, let me even show an image of these. Um, kind of fun, yeah, so they look, look like this, which to me is terrifying to see because just kind of scary to imagine that these cables are at the bottom of the ocean. Um, they're laid by these big boats, these big barges that uh, like go and uh, like unspool this thick cabling and then kind of attached to a weight that drops it all the way to the bottom of the ocean. Um, uh, uh, 
So anyway, this cable goes all the way from New York to London. Um, and then our next cable takes us all the way from London down to Cape Town in South Africa. And then we pop up from South Africa up to Namibia. And it looks like to a city called Windhoek, which is the capital of Namibia, I guess it is. Um, so again, super cool that this is the path that the data that we just sent took all the way around the world. Um, okay, now we're gonna get to our final tool for today. Um, well, let me run one more actually. I'm just super curious to see this for the University of Munich, lmu.de. Um, I wanna see what this looks like, u.de. Um, I wonder if it'll go through London again. I'm guessing yes, because London is conveniently located very close to the, uh, I mean, right on the Atlantic Ocean. And so it's a very convenient place to have a cable, um, a subsea cable arrive. Okay, so this time what happened? Yeah, this, so this one's a great example. Um, so here we can see the data started from Berkeley, went to Chicago, and then strangely came back to Berkeley. Um, one, I'm not really sure what's going on here. Maybe this is a bug and the kind of tool, not really a bug, but the, sometimes the track information that we have on what's going on on the internet isn't super accurate. But another possibility is that sometimes the internet makes kind of irrational decisions. And that could be because of some sort of economic relationships where uh, even though it's a more direct path to go from Chicago to say Amsterdam here, maybe there's actually some cheaper option to go from California but there are different entities at each point along the way. And so maybe I'm paying Sonic over here in, in California to take my data. And then Sonic hands that data off to maybe AT&T, who is their partner in Chicago. And then AT&T happens to partner with, um, with, I don't know, Deutsche Telekom or something, or you know, not Deutsche Telekom, but like T-Mobile uh, or maybe Google Fiber. And so they, they, they hand that data back off to Google Fiber, which happens to be have their kind of cable starting from back in California. And so you get these weird behaviors because of economic incentives that make the internet not behave as logically as one would expect it to. But anyway, one way or another, our actual next hop takes us all the way to Amsterdam. And then from Amsterdam, we go to Frankfurt, it seems, from Frankfurt to Berlin, and then from Berlin all the way to, this is, Garching Bay München, so Munich. Cool. Okay, let's get to our last tool for today. Um, ah, before that, let me just point out, along the way you saw, um, as I talk through this, you see latencies at every hop. That's kind of cool. You can see exactly how long it's taking and debug if a really long, you have a really long ping latency, why that is, which router along the way is causing that. You can also see the router names. And as I pointed out, as we saw, they oftentimes have location names in them. Not every router reported its name, and sometimes they just gave an IP. Sometimes they're more secretive about who they are, but you can still roughly map an IP to a physical location. Not super accurately, but oftentimes roughly. And as we saw, we get these weird stars. Some routers along the way just don't want to say who they are. They're very secretive. Okay, the last tool I'm going to talk about um, is called DIG. Um, and this is used to map from name to IP address. And we're gonna spend a couple of lectures learning to understand the system that this uses and why it is the way it is. But at a very high level, like you don't think of Google as you know 1.1.1.1 or some other IP address. You think of Google as google.com. The internet makes decisions on where to hand packets off to based on IP addresses. Um, so just like the postal service, you don't write to Alice because the postal service doesn't know who Alice is. They understand addresses. And so you would actually write Alice's address because that's the system, that's the destination that the postal service understands. Uh, same thing for the internet. And so that mapping of figuring out how to go from Alice to Alice's internet, which for you is a contact book, on the internet um, is something called, uh, a system called DNS, Domain Name Service. You don't need to know any of this yet. We're gonna cover it later on in the lecture, but just wanted to point it out. If you were curious, every time I would type 
pinggoogle.com, how did we know what address? How did my tool ping know what address to go to? Well, it uses the service and I'll just quickly show you how this uh, kind of looks. If I come here and I type, let's try dig berkeley, whoops, berkeley.edu. I got this kind of big monster response back. And by the way, by the end of the semester, you'll know how to read this whole response and what it all means. But if you kind of squint, you can see here it says answer section. Look, it says berkeley.edu. And here's something that looks like an IP address. It says 35, 163, 72, 93. So that's Berkeley's IP address. Um, let me try another one. If I go to ping unam.edu.na, oops, I didn't use ping. Instead, I had wanted to dig. And here you can see I got a response back again. Don't worry about this whole format. We'll learn about it later. But again, just kind of squint and you can see answer section and it says unam.edu.na. And here the IP is 41.205.129.157. So that is the IP address of the University of Namibia's uh, uh, servers that are serving its website. Um, and I mean, there's a service, I, I, I mentioned it in the slides here, iplocation.net, that roughly lets you map from an IP address to an actual physical location on the map, and it just gives you a point. Again, not super accurately, but you can kind of estimate those things. Okay, a last bonus uh, uh, piece of information. If you're curious to know what your computer's IP address is, um, you could go and pull up system preferences on a Mac and go to network, advanced, TCP IP, and here's a screenshot I took uh, that shows my uh, uh, kind of IPv6 and IPv4 addresses here. Don't worry about this yet. We're going to learn all about addressing, how it came to be, what's the difference between IPv4 and IPv6, why it's needed, so on and so forth. But just if you're curious to play around. If you have Windows or Linux, I'm sorry, I, I don't actually know how to find it, but I bet we could look it up on Google. Okay, with that, we're done with our first discussion, and um, we'll... See you for lecture and next discussion. Thanks. Bye.